All right, so um, last week, last two days, we have to make them count. Um, so as you can see, um, I've added some things to the folder for today, including um, the some multiple choice problems from I think an older ACS study guide on carboxylic acids and derivatives uh, and also enolates that we're going to talk about today and and Wednesday and then also from last semester the from last semester, the final exam, um, multi this is a, a practice, practice uh, set of practice problems that I've done, that I did um, put together. Now the first, I think, seven of these problems are we're going to do this week. So after that, it's a review of Organic 1. There's also then in this folder a second set of multiple choice problems that I wrote as as a review for this semester. So in addition to the ACS um, ACS study guides that are in the library on two hour reserve there's also about 150 or so problems here that you can look at in reviewing for the final. So remember, the final's next Wednesday. It's next Wednesday for both classes. So um, there's an answer key there um, that you can use in between now and then. As I said with my email last night, the Chapter 24 top hat problems are going to be required. And then anything you do in Chapter 25 and 26, I'll add on. Um, as bonus points to all of the top hat stuff, all the top hat chapters. I'm gonna have to do that manually, so it's gonna <coughs> it's gonna take me into next week to do that. But that's what we'll do with chapter twenty with chapter twenty five and twenty six. Okay. <coughs> and. The elevator's broken, which is why I don't have my cart, but your exams are not on my cart, so I'm still working through them, so hopefully I'll have them on Wednesday. Okay. All right. So. Let's talk about it. So in chapter 26, we have we're going to do what's called enolate or enolate and um, related reactions. So let me kind of show you what those are and what and where where this is kind of related to where. We we were at with aldehydes and ketones. So, I'm just trying to pull up. Start with an aldehyde. Now, <coughs> we reacted aldehydes with a lot of different reagents. We reacted them with Grignards or Ganolithiums. We reacted them with water. We reacted them with alcohol. We reacted them with amines. And in these two cases, we needed to use acid as the catalyst, 
in order to add those weak nucleophiles across the carbon-oxygen double bond. Why didn't we just use an alkoxide or a hydroxide in those cases? Why? Because then we wouldn't have needed the H plus to help the nucleophile add to the carbonyl. Well, the reason that we didn't do that is because they don't add to the carbonyl. They do something different. And what they do different is they actually deprotonate the enolin. They deprotonate the ketone or the aldehyde. Or the ester, as we'll see later. So let's talk about terminology. In carbonyl chemistry, the carbon attached to the to the uh, double bond is an alpha carbon, and then it goes beta and gamma and delta on down the line. So the alpha carbon is the carbon next to the carbonyl. And it turns out that that carbon is acidic. So that if I want to, I can deprotonate that carbon with an alkoxide. And if I deprotonate it, I end up forming that species, a C minus, which is great, but okay, what does that, what does it mean? And so what this, what this compound is, is what we will call an enolate. This structure has two resonance structures that I can draw. So this, these both of these resonance structures make up what's called an enolate. Now an enolate is just a deprotonated enol. So this species right here is the one you could see that if I put an H on it, it would be an enol. This is a deprotonated enol. So that's where the enolate term comes from. You can't, we can't call it an enol oxide like we would alkoxides. So the AT suffix just means something has a negative charge. So these are my two resonance structures. Now we could get into the issue of which one of these, because now what I've done is I've made a nucleophile, so which of these two resonance structures is going to be the nucleophile? It's going to be the C minus. So the neat C minus is what I'm going to use as my nucleophile for this reaction, for the reactions that I'm going to talk about. So when we do when we react the ketone or aldehyde with an alkoxide, the problem there is that there's always an equilibrium. So if I was to rewrite this, what it would really look like is if I take my aldehyde or my ketone and I react it with an alkoxide, there's going to be an equilibrium between the enolate and basically the alkoxide. And this is kind of the classical older method of forming enolates. What we would do is we would just simply, to generate the alkoxide, we would react the alkoxide, we'd have an alkoxide hydroxide mixture. So the problem is we have lots of equilibria going on, but we will form some enolate in this process. So let's think of this enolate as if it was an R minus. It's a C minus, so let's treat it like a Grignard. <coughs> so if I take an aldehyde or a ketone and I add to it a mixture of alcohol hydroxide or even the pure alkoxide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that enolate ion 
but now it's going to be the in the presence of some unenalyzed aldehyde and ketone. So because of the equilibrium, you're going to have some of this unreacted and some of the deprotonated aldehyde. And so they're going to react together. In other words, this is going to be like the R minus that's going to come in and attack the carbonyl as we learned with the Grignard. And so what kind of product do we get? Before we write the product, when we first start, I find it useful to number everything so that we can keep track of where things are going. So let's number this carbonyl number one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, and carbon six. So that way we can keep track of what's going on. Now if this was simply a Grignard, here's what I would do. I would say, oh, I've done this before, I've got an O minus, I have this R group that's attached, and there's my product. But what's R? R is now this entire enolate molecule with what I labeled as carbon 5 being the attachment point. So now let, let me rewrite that down here. So here's... So this C minus is what's going to add to the carbonyl. And so this is carbon 1, 2, and 3. So what's going to be attached to carbon 1? Carbon 5, which is a CH. What's attached to carbon 5? The C double bond OH, the aldehyde part. So this is 5. What's attached to that? Carbon 4. And then what's attached on the other side? Carbon And if you wanted to, you could put, you could colorize the enolate and colorize the key, the other unenolized aldehyde, and then you could bring them together. Bless you. And what you're doing is you're making this carbon-carbon bond. So now I've got an O minus because this is carbon one. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to react that with a little bit of acid and so I'm going to make my final product. And what we normally do is this. We normally kind of stretch out the molecule. So we stretch out the molecule so that it looks like that. So basically, here's what ha here's how the molecule's broken apart. That molecule came from the enolate. This is the enolate portion, and then this is came from the basically the carbonyl or the unenolized portion. So let's take a step back. Because all the reactions we're going to talk about, except for a couple twists here and there, they always start with deprotonating an alpha hydrogen. I deprotonate an alpha hydrogen to make a C minus. That C minus is going to attack the carbonyl. And exactly like a Grignard, except this is a complicated molecule. And so I'm going to make this new carbon carbon bond and form that molecule. Now, this generic product is named an aldol product. And it's named an aldol product because 
Originally when this was done, it was done with an aldehyde. So the final product is aldehyde, half aldehyde, half alcohol. And so that's where the aldol came from. This is one of the few carbon-carbon bond formations that doesn't have a person associated with it. There is no Dr. Aldol that came up with this reaction. There are going to be some names associated with the other ones, but um, not this one. Okay. So let me, I'm just going to rewrite this bigger. Also what this is called is, this is an alpha carbon, this is your beta carbon, this is your gamma carbon, and that's your delta carbon. So this is also called a beta hydroxy aldehyde. And so when we make these products, we're going to sometimes use the beta terminology to say, well, what's there? Sometimes it'll be a beta keto, sometimes it'll be a beta hydroxy, sometimes it's going to be an alpha beta unsaturated, meaning that I'm going to have a double bond. And so this is actually what happens in the aldol condensation. And I, we said this is an, I said this is an aldol reaction. I didn't say why, didn't say why it's a condensation reaction. But here's what happens when you do an aldol reaction, reacting the enolate and the ketone or aldehyde. What happens is, is that you lose water in a second step. It doesn't take much to actually lose water. So if I lose H2O from that molecule, I'm going to form a double bond. And so I'm going to have the double bond And now I'm going to have an alpha beta unsaturated, in this case, aldehyde. Flush. So these molecules, once you make the beta hydroxy compound, they tend to want to undergo elimination of water very easily. And so they will to form the alpha beta unsaturated. Why do they do that? Because this double bond is now in conjugation with the carbonyl. So they're going to want to lose water to form that conjugation. So this overall then is what's called an aldol condensation reaction. And the aldol, because Traditionally, the product was half alcohol, half aldehyde. Condensation means that in the reaction, you're making a molecule of water as a product. So you're losing water. That's what condensation means. So this is a very straightforward reaction from the standpoint that the new thing, the two new things are deprotonate the alpha hydrogen and then lose water at the end to form an alpha beta unsaturated system. But the reaction of the R minus with the carbonyl, it's just a bigger, more complicated R minus than it was with the Grignard. And that's why initially I like to number them so I can keep track of where everything is at. Everybody kind of with me? Okay. Now, this is, the way that this is taught in all the textbooks is the old, this is sort of 1950s, 1960s chemistry. Um, there, is, there are new ways to do this reaction. And I'll just show you how we could have a little bit more control. And that is that 
instead of using an alkoxide to just do an equilibrium deprotonation, if I was to react a stronger base that did 100% deprotonation, then I could actually have the enolate in a bottle not reacting with its unenolized self, and then I could put in whatever aldehyde or ketone I want in the next step. So the base that we usually use is, well, one of the bases that was developed was what's called lithium diisopropyl amide, or LDA. It's a sterically hindered nitrogen base. And so the N minus means that it completely deprotonates, but the steric hindrance keeps the amide from being a nucleophile. You might say, well, what about tertiary It's still an alkoxide, so it still would partially deprotonate it, which means when I partially deprotonate it, I've got enolate, I've got unenolized, and they're going to react. This way, it's a 100% reaction. So this way, I can make my enolate without having it react, and I can make that 100% keep it and then I can add, okay, what do I want to add to it? What aldehyde or ketone next? What I showed you earlier is what's called a self-aldol condensation because the molecule is making an enolate and then reacting with itself. So this is sort of the modern, I don't know, 70s way of doing this. And I should probably take a little bit of a digression here and go back to the original enolate and say this, this enolate molecule right here, particularly, well, let me take a step all the way back to the beginning, the two resonance structures. This form of the enolate Could resemble structurally the enamine. So when we talked about enamines, we didn't really have a purpose for them, but enamines actually do reactions very similar to enolate. So that they would react, they would react, and then you would be able to convert the nitrogen part back into a carbonyl at the end. So en enamines and enolates do very, very similar reactions, <coughs> and there are advantages to each one. Um, but that's where the that's where that's where the enamines are like um, enolates. So once I can make the enolate, then I can do all sorts of things with it. And every one of these things that we do is going to be slightly different, but yet the same. So we're kind of like with carboxylic acid derivatives where they all kind of mush together because they look the same. That's what's going to happen here. But the good thing about that is that we're always starting with the same thing. We're always starting with this enolate by deprotonating it. So we can react this enolate then with an aldehyde or ketone, make a beta hydroxy compound, eliminate water to form the alpha beta unsaturated compound. But what else can I do with it? Um, sometimes I like to take, bless you, sometimes I like to take this enolate, bless you, and I might want to say, let's react this with something like methyl iodide. If I took this enolate and reacted it with methyl iodide, what is going to happen? My R minus is what? A 
Electrophile, nucleophile. Nucleophile. The CH3I, the C is electrophilic. So the C minus is going to come over, kick off the iodide, so that what I can do is I can now alkylate. So I can do an alkylation reaction. So if I have an aldehyde or a ketone and I want to add an alkyl group to the alpha carbon, make the enolate, alkylate it with methyl iodide, methyl bromide, methyl chloride, or ethyl. Probably would be best if this was a primary alkyl halide, just so it'll go smooth. There's no name to that, I'm just alkylating an enolate. I can also, once I have my enolate, and I'm going to use the same enolate here, just I can also react this with Br2. So I can brominate it. What will happen is this C- minus will come over and attack the bromine and I will make, I will put a bromine on that carbon. On the alpha carbon. And I make, in this case, an alpha bromo aldehyde. I could make alpha bromo ketones. What could I do with those? I could do lots of things. I could have nucleophiles come in and kick off the bromine. So it gives me a chance to functionalize the alpha carbon. I had to, I think I had to do this in graduate school where I had to put like an, a sulfur group on here. And so if I turned my aldehyde or my ketone into an al to, into this alpha bromo aldehyde or ketone, I could have a sulfur group come in, kick off the bromine, and then what I ended up doing, I think, was reducing this carbonyl down to an alcohol. What I quickly found was that this molecule is called a lacrimator. Very quickly found that out. What is a lacrimator? Um, what things are what common things are lacrimators? Onions organic chemistry, right? Things that make people cry. So these compounds, these compounds, all it takes is a little bit of them and they cause you to tear up. So I had to be super careful, put everything in a bag, wrap it up. Um, had to put the trash outside so the cleaning people didn't come in the lab. So they didn't have to come in the lab if there was any escaping from the hood. Um, but this, what this does is it lets me put a bromine on the alpha carbon and now we can think of all the different reactions we've done to replace that bromine. If I protected this aldehyde, I could make it a Grignier. So we can also do that to the enolate. So, it all starts with this enolate. Great. So, we get to some of the more. Most of the time when we do the aldol reactions, what we have to do is we have to, we do a mixed, we can do a mixed reaction. So let's just say for the sake of argument that I'm going to start with my this same aldehyde and I don't want it to react with itself. So one of the things I might do is what's called a mixed aldol. Now a mixed aldol condensation is when I'm going to take one ketone or aldehyde that has an alpha hydrogen that can be removed and I'm going to take a second 
aldehyde or ketone that does not have an alpha hydrogen. So that even with this reaction, if I reacted it with an alcohol and hydroxide, what's going to happen is the alcohol hydroxide is going to form some alkoxide. That alkoxide is going to come over here and deprotonate the aldehyde with that has the alpha hydrogen. It cannot react with benzaldehyde here because there is no hydrogen on that alpha carbon. So I'm only going to make one enolate. And now that enolate is going to react with the aldehyde that doesn't have an alpha hydrogen. So it's going to come over here, react with that. If you want, you could write, I can write my original aldehyde, and now what did it do? It reacted. with the benzaldehyde to form that alkoxide. So again, if we take a step back, hopefully you can see that the top part of the molecule here came from the enolate. The bottom part of the molecule came after that enolate attacked the carbonyl. So then I'm going to end up forming going to lose this is going to lose a water to complete the condensation reaction so I'm going to end up with a CH3 attached to the C which is then going to be attached up here to the C double bond to the aldehyde and then I'm going to have a double bond down here with the H and the benzene ring as a pH for phenyl. So now I still have my alpha, beta, unsaturated aldehyde. And this reaction is going to occur pretty easily because the double bond is now going to not only be in conjugation with the, with the carbonyl, but it's also going to be in conjugation with the benzene ring. So this is mixed from the standpoint of if one of the one of the aldehydes or ketones has an alpha hydrogen, the other one doesn't, then it forces. We know which one's going to form the enolate, and then hopefully that enolate is going to react with the other molecule that doesn't have the hydrogen. So it, all it can do is be attacked by the enolate. So again, these are all kind of just, what can I do with that enolate once I form it? <coughs> okay. What else can I do? The other thing I could do is I could potentially take a molecule that looks like this. And the ROH, OH minus, again, the purpose of that is to form some alkoxide, which then is going to go ahead and deprotonate one of the alpha hydrogens. Now, in this case, when I use two functional groups like this, I have two alpha hydrogens, but
but I made this molecule symmetrical. So it doesn't matter whether I take a hydrogen from the alpha carbon on the left or the right. So if this R minus comes in and maybe deprotonates the hydrogen on the left, I'm going to end up with this, with this enolate. And now in this case, that enolate, a couple things could happen. That enolate could probably react with another molecule, with another long chain molecule, but our intent here is to have this minus now attack the other carbonyl, so that what I'm going to do is close and make a ring. So this is going to be an example of an intra molecular reaction. And at this point, I'm going to want a number because I'm going to get lost. So we'll go carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, 4, 5, and then 6. And so if I'm writing the product of this reaction, I know it's going to be a beta hydroxyaldehyde. But what size ring do I have? Well, I'm going to have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 membered ring. Those are the five carbons that are going to be involved in the ring. So I'm going to make a five membered ring. I'm just going to go ahead and number, it's going to be numbers two to six, two, three, four, five, and six that are going to be involved in that ring. Um, what's attached to carbon two? The aldehyde. What's a, carbon two and six are attached together? Carbon six over here now has the OH and the H attached to it. So I'm taking and making an enolate and having it attack the aldehyde in the other in the same molecule. So now I'm going to close up the ring. And you could say, what if I would have wanted to react carbon five, deprotonate carbon five? You could do that and then it would just react with carbon one. But in this case, I made the molecule symmetric, so it doesn't matter. Okay. So here is my alpha beta hydroxy aldehyde. And so what's gonna happen next? I'm gonna lose water. So that I'm gonna close up that five-membered ring. and make this alpha beta unsaturated aldol condensation product. So we could also do this intramolecularly. So when you see the mixture of alcohol hydroxide, that means you're going to deprotonate an alpha hydrogen. You find your alpha hydrogen, you deprotonate it, that alpha hydrogen is going to attack a carbonyl. You're going to end up making then a beta hydroxy aldehyde or ketone, and then lose water to form the alpha beta unsaturated system. Now, let's be honest at this point. Next Wednesday, when you take the final exam, it's all multiple choice. Don't be like my freshman advisees when I asked them. What, two years ago, I, I was talking about study skills with them, which was a mistake, I found out. Because they said, oh, you guys have, you have a quiz on Friday. So how are you going to study for that quiz? And they said, well, what kind of test, what kind of quiz is it? And I'm like, how does that matter? 
And then they went through all the possibilities and said, well, if there's multiple choice, I probably won't study because I'll just guess. Do not do that. These are these were freshmen in their second week, right? They had a lot to learn, a lot to learn. I don't know whether they have or not, but so don't guess unless you're absolutely at the end of your rope. But whenever you do an aldol condensation like this, you're always going to get in the final product, an alpha beta unsaturated compound. So if you were going to guess, make an educated guess. If you look through and you don't see, an, if you only see like one alpha beta unsaturated ketone, that's a bad question. Because you should have more than one to choose from. But anything that's not an alpha beta unsaturated ketone, that's not the right product. So you can kind of limit your answers that you're going to be guessing at, if I guess you're guessing, by looking at, in each one of these cases, what am I making? So you make a beta hydroxy, then an alpha beta unsaturated. So again, all I'm doing is adding some twists to this molecule. That's why it's hopefully at this point you're going, okay, this looks pretty straightforward. Deprotonate the alpha hydrogen, react that C minus with a carbonyl. Okay. Well, let's go on to any, something more than an aldehyde or a ketone. Let's go to an ester. So in my ester, all I'm going to do is I'm going to change. I'm just going to change it from an aldehyde and ketone to an ester. Now esters are a little bit more difficult to deprotonate, but classically we can still react those with a mixture of alcohol and hydroxide, and that's still going to make the RO minus, which is now going to come over and it's going to deprotonate the alpha carbon. So what I'm going to do here is what's called a self-condensation reaction. So I'm going to take two of these molecules, enolize one, react it with the other molecule that was unenolized. Okay, so that means I'm going to end up with my CH minus, and I'm going to go ahead and react that with the unenolized ester. So if I want a number, one, two, three on the enolate, four, five, and six, my C minus is going to react with the carbonyl. So when I put this molecule together, I'm going to have, well, I'm just going to put it together on top of each other against my better judgment here. Okay, so my C minus is going to come down, attack my carbonyl, make the O minus. What happens next? The O minus is, well, it depends on what you mean by that. Like you could attack the carbon? Um, I don't think attack is the word you want. Would the O minus come down and then take off the ester? Because the O minus wants to do what? Reform the carbonyl bond. 
right? So the O minus wants to come down and reform the carbonyl, and if it does that, the ester, the OR group of the ester can leave. I'm kind of assuming that's what you both had in mind. Then you're like, oh, we still have to remember that stuff? Well, yeah. I mean, we do have the, if nothing else, for the final exam. I mean, you can forget about all this stuff come next Friday. Actually, Wednesday, if you'd like. I hope you don't, right? Because you paid a lot of money to hopefully jam all this stuff in there. Hopefully some of it sticks, at least for the future. Is this what we this is what we did all of the last two weeks, right? Bring the O minus down, have a kick off a group. So what's the twist when you react an ester enolate with itself? The twist is you now make a beta keto. Ester. Because when you make the O minus, it comes down and it kicks off the OR group. And this is what's called a Claisen condensation. Claisen condensation is when you do an enolate reaction using an ester enolate with itself. <clears throat> so that's the twist. You make a beta keto ester. And there's another twist that we'll start with on Wednesday. The twist being that that ester can be hydrolyzed to a carboxylic acid and once that happens, I can do what's called decarboxylation and remove it completely. And I'll talk about that on Wednesday because people who write ACS exams love decarboxylation reactions for some reason. And so it's something that, even though we're doing it on the last day, it's something that you will probably see. And so we'll talk about why that happens. Um, I will have more information. I know it's the last week and everybody's like, what about our resumes? What about our cover letters? What about our LinkedIn? I gotta talk to Logan and see exactly how they're all gonna get me that information. So if you've done it, you're good. If you haven't done it, then you'll have you know some time because it'll be until next week when before the final grades are due that you can get that taken care of but I think you just have to have it approved or something I'll have the information because I need to talk to him exactly how it's going to happen if you have questions 